Hello guys, welcome to this new video. So this is going to be question 9, the last question in the May 2023 time zone 2 paper 2. So here we're given a uh, we're given that a magnesium nuclei decays into uh, nuclei of aluminium 27 by beta minus decay. We're, and then the first question in the first question, we need to show that using the data that the energy stored, energy released in the decay of magnesium 27 is about 2.62 mega electron volts. So first of all, let's just think about the reaction that is happening here. So we have a magnesium nuclei. We are told that it's 27 and proton number of 12, and it decays into aluminium and the beta minus particle which we know is minus one zero. And then we see that the aluminum has to be 13, 27, as the mass number and the proton number must be conserved, both on the left and on the right side. And then we need to calculate the energy released here. We're given the masses of the nuclei and also the unified atomic mass unit. So the natural first step would be to think about this equation equals mc squared where delta m is the mass defect and the c is the speed of light so we in fact just need to plug our values in here so this will be then the change in energy is just the change in mass so the mass of the aluminum minus the mass of the magnesium so 26.9843 minus 26.98153 and then we still need to convert this as right now we are in atomic mass units but we will want to end up with some units of energy so that is why we are given uh, this this constant as we are told that one unified atomic mass unit is this many mega electron volts per c squared so if we multiply with this number then we will have units of a of mega electron volts per c squared but we obviously still need to multiply by uh, the speed of light squared which is 3 times 10 to the 8 squared and like this we will end up with units of mega electron volts this will be 2.6175 12 mega electron volts so we we just had to multiply with this 931 and a half to convert the units of atomic mass units to units of energy. Usually this, this way is much easier to calculate as we don't need to convert them one by one or, any, or anything. We can just multiply by a constant. And then in part B, we are told that a magnesium 27 nucleus can decay by one of two roots. Um, in the first root, 70% 70 of, 70 of the beta minus particles emit some kinetic energy accompanied by a gamma photon. In the other root, 30% of the beta particles have some lower kinetic energy and emit a gamma photon of energy a little bit higher. So, so here pretty much what's going on is, is that this decay is happening that we mentioned up here. But uh, the the like it can, it can decay in different ways. So like 70% of the beta particles that are emitted in this reaction um, decay this way and the remaining 30% are emitted with this much energy plus a photon with this much energy. And we are told that the final state of aluminum 27 is the same for both roots. And we need to state the conclusion that can be drawn from the existence of these two roots. So in short, these two roots, uh, so they uh, show the existence of nuclear energy levels. And the reason this is, is because nuclear energy levels are, are pretty much the same as the electron levels. So if we think about this diagram where we have the levels, converging at higher energy levels. So like this is level n equals one, n equals two, n equals three, n equals four, and so on. 
and the electrons can only jump between these levels and these correspond to discrete energies being released that's why we only have these two options these two are like like a constant energy values for the beta minus particles that and so for example when they jump from n4 to n2 they release uh, 1.76 and when they jump from n3 to n2 they release only 1.59 they release a little bit le less energy but since we have these two distinct roots it showed that we cannot have like energy levels in between these energy levels we can't be on an energy level of like 2.5 or 1.5 or something we must be on these discrete energy levels and so that is why uh, it shows this and then we need to calculate the difference between the magnitudes of the total energy transfers in part a and b so what we generally just need to do is calculate this change in energy from from part a minus the energy from part b so in part a what we found was this 2.61755 and then we need to subtract it. So we need to subtract the energies we were given in part B. So if we, for example, look at root one, that's 1.76656 plus 0.84376. And if we do the subtraction, we find that this is 0 0.007195. And then we can also do it for root two. So this was root 1 and then root 2 will have to be the exact same calculation and uh, we just have to uh, add these different numbers here but other than that is going to be the same and um, yeah so you would have to do the same thing I'm not going to write that down it's just plugging in the values but it will give the same result so 0 0.007195 you could have also done by just adding these two numbers and then these two numbers showing that their product is the same. I mean, their sum is the same. And so you only have to subtract them once since uh, both numbers are the same both times. So we're going to have the same change in energy. I mean, the same difference in energy. And then we need to explain how this difference arises. Well, first of all, we should see that both energy differences are the same. So there's something that is carrying away this specific amount of energy as the, the energy of the photon is kind of corresponding to the energy carried away by this third particle, which is going to be the antineutrino. So we have a missing particle here as we didn't really ever mention a, a, a neutrino here in this question, but whenever we have a beta minus decay, we must also have a, a neutrino being released. And so here in this case, since we're emitting a beta minus particle, there's going to be an antineutrino. Antineutrino. And this, this carries away this remaining energy. And so that is why we found the same value of 0 0.07195 in both questions. I mean, for both roots, as in both roots, uh, there's an extra antineutrino with, with this much amount of energy. And that doesn't change here. And then we take a little bit of a different step here. Here we need to calculate some things. And then we're told that we have small amounts of magnesium and... Uh, well, small amounts of magnesium can be detected by firing neutrons at this magnesium-26. And when we fire these neutrons at the magnesium-26, we form magnesium-27, which is going to be radioactive, is going to uh, produce beta particle emissions, and it's going to decay into aluminum-27. So pretty much what we have been talking about till now is that here they just told us as well that this magnesium-27 is produced by firing neutrons at a magnesium-26. And then we are told that the smallest mass of magnesium that can be detected is 1.1 times 10 to the minus 8 kilograms. And we need to show that the smallest number of magnesium atoms 
that can be detected is 10 to the 17. So we know the smallest mass. We just need to show the smallest number of particles. So here we just need to do a simple conversion from mass to particles. So if we first find the number of moles, this mass corresponds to from moles, we can easily calculate, calculate the particles as a mole is just a measure of how many particles we have. And the way we measure, we can calculate the number of moles is we just take the mass of our substance and divide it by our molar mass. Since we have magnesium 27, our molar mass is just going to be 27. So we just take the mass, the smallest mass we can observe. This is in kilograms, so we're going to have to convert this because our molar mass here is always in gram per mole. And so if we want to divide gram by gram, we need to convert this kilogram on the top to grams, which we do by multiplying by a thousand. And this will be 4.07 times 10 to the minus 7 moles. And then we know that one mole is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23 particles. So if we know we have this many moles, then we just need to multiply these two numbers. And then we find that the number of atoms that we can see is just 4.07 times 10 to the minus 7 times 6.02 times 10 to the 23. This will be 2.45 times 10 to the 17 atoms, which is approximately 10 to the 17. And then in part two, we're given that a sample of gas is irradiated with neutrons so that all magnesiums become magnesium 27. So now we just have a sample of magnesium 26 and we make all of it become magnesium 27. And we are told how many, how many magnesium atoms we have. And we're also told the decay constant this is the lambda that we're going to use in the formulas. And then we need to determine the number of aluminium atoms that form in 10 minutes after the irradiation ends. So after the irradiation ends just means after the radiation starts. So if we look in the data booklet, you will see that we have this equation that relates the number of particles with the decay constant and time. So we know the initial number of particles was uh, 9.5 times 10 to the 15. And we want to see how many particles will we have after 10 minutes. So uh, all we kind of have to do is plug it in. So 9.5 times 10 to the 15 times e to the minus 1.22 times 10 to the minus three. You want to make sure that this is in seconds. And then if this is in seconds, then we also want to make sure that the time we input is in, test in seconds and 10 minutes is just 600 seconds. So if we plug this in, we find that this will be 4.57 times 10 to the 15 magnesium atoms. And it's important we see that this is magnesium atoms as we're calculating with magnesium atoms here. But the question asks for the number of aluminium atoms that are formed. So the number of atoms during the decay remains constant. So how much ever a magnesium is converted into aluminium? Well, I mean, so, the, so like if we had 9.5 times 10 to the 15 initially and we decreased to this amount, the amount we decreased by is the amount that got converted into magnesium 27. So we lost some magnesium atoms, but all of those became aluminium atoms as, the, as there must be a conservation of atoms here. So the number of uh, Al27 will just be um, the initial number of particles that we had, which is 9.5, and we subtract from 4.7 times 10 to the 15. So this is how many magnesium atoms we lost. So this is how many aluminium atoms we gained. So this will be 9.3 times 10 to the 15 atoms. 
And then for the last question in the paper, we need to estimate in watts the average rate at which energy is transferred by the decay of magnesium-27 during the 10 minutes after the irradiation ends. So we need to go all the way back to the start of this question where we show that one magnesium-27 nucleus uh, releases this many mega electron volts. So now we know that how many particles we had, this uh, 4.93 times 10 to the 15. So what we need to do here is uh, first calculate the total energy. Total energy that is released as we need to calculate the power. So and power is just energy over time. So we need to see how much energy released in this 10 minutes or 60 seconds. So what we need to do is uh, take this 2.62 that we had up here. Yes, 2.62. And we need to multiply by the number of particles, which we calculated here to be 4.62. 57 times 10 to the 15. Oh no, sorry, sorry, no, the other way. Because we need because the energy released by the magnesium atoms, well the those magnesium atoms release energy that got converted. So this is just how many how many atoms that remained after this uh, 10 minutes, which means that this many magnesium atoms radiated their energy. So we need to multiply by this. 4.93 times 10 to the 15. As this is how many magnesium particles that and atoms that decayed. And then we are not done yet because we ideally want some units of energy. And um, this 2.62 is in mega electron volts. So we want to convert this mega electron volts into joules. And well, we know that one mega electron volt is 10 to the 6 electron volts and we also know that one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules so if we multiply what we have written till now by 10 to the 6 to convert into electron volts and then 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 to convert into joules we will find that we released approximately 2100 joules if we round it a bit and so if we want to find the power, we just need to divide this energy by the time it took. So 2100 divided by 600 seconds. This will give us 3.5 watts. And uh, this is how you solve question nine, in the, which is the last question in the May 2023 time zone two paper two. I hope this was helpful and see you in the next question.